Great, this is great. Um, we have been off for uh, most of the summer uh, outside of uh, Don's class on evangelism, which was a big help and a great run up to uh, some of the evangelism events that we had. Uh, we've really had a break. Uh, you guys have had the chance to wake up, uh, go fishing, go to breakfast, and then come to church because we have church so late, right? Um, but here we are, we're back. I need to get back into our rhythm, so bear with me on this first day. Uh, we are going to get into how to study the Bible. That is the purpose of this class that we're doing. Let me get uh, some of these things rearranged here. Now, <clears throat> how we study the Bible is going to be absolutely crucial for our Christian lives. Crucial. Sloppy irresponsible, lazy handling of the Bible is going to be very detrimental to our Christian lives for a whole host of reasons, and we'll be getting into them as we go. Um, the format of this class is going to be today we'll, we'll essentially kind of lay down some important principles, some important uh, uh, um, guidelines, you might say, and then we're going to learn uh, in the next couple of weeks each of the steps of what's called the inductive Bible study method, okay, the inductive Bible study method. There'll be three steps to that, and we'll spend one week on each step really exploring it. We'll be doing examples together to really kind of get familiar and acquainted with how to do each step. And so that'll be three weeks of that. And then um, to wrap up the class, we're actually going to take a passage. We're just going to have it up on the board, and from the very beginning of a bare passage, we're going to work our way through those three steps together so that we can get the experience of applying everything that we learned in this class. Uh, I think it'll be very exciting. I think it'll be a lot of fun. I think it'll be very helpful for you, and I hope this is going to be profitable. So why don't we bow for a moment, and we're going to pray and ask God's blessing on his word and this class, and uh, then we'll open up. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. The Lord Jesus said to his disciples, you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And God, your word is not to be trifled with. Your word is to be approached reverently, humbly, seriously, with a ready spirit. And that's the kind of spirit we pray today for, Father, that we are ready to take what we learn and apply it in our lives. We pray, Father, for wisdom. We pray, Father, for uh, a, a greater grasp of what you mean in your word. The study, Father, that we are about to embark on is to help us understand who you are and what you meant by what you said. And so therefore, God, um, let us do away with all, all the, the baggage that we bring to the scriptures, hoping it means something, making it shift and twist into what we want it to mean, not caring what is meant by the author, but instead caring only what we want it to mean. God, may all these things just, just, just fall away, and may we handle the scriptures as those who are approved, those who correctly handle them, those who... Who, who are responsible in knowing that we give an account for what, we're, for what we do with what we're given. And so, Father, today, bless this, bless this class, bless this series in the coming weeks. God, and may your people be strengthened. May your people be wise, wiser, Father. And may your people uh, be even more adept at handling this marvelous treasure that we hold in our hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, so where would I begin? Um, the first place I would begin is, is the, the importance, okay, of um, what the Bible says about the Bible. So if you do have your Bible, and I hope that you do today, uh, open up to Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 119, Verse 89. If anybody memorizes Psalm 119 between now and next week Sunday, I will take you out to McDonald's. Yes. <laughs> Somebody's motivated now. I got one. 
Psalm 119, the Cadillac of the Psalms. Verse 89, he says, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. See, God's word endures. God's word lasts forever. God's word does not change. Okay? Which is a characteristic of God, the immutable characteristic of God. Uh, if you're in Psalms, turn to Isaiah 55, 11, One, no doubt that uh, you have heard, and if you haven't, you're about to be blessed. But so, uh, Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, let's start in verse 9, we'll get down through verse 11. And this is the Lord speaking. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Okay, if you don't want to memorize Psalm 119, you memorize that between now and next week. I'll give you a standing ovation next week. That's an awesome verse. Okay, uh, go to, uh, let's see what's the next one I want to go to real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So way over in the New Testament. What book is before 2 Timothy? There's a little help for anybody looking. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in other words, being righteous in your lifestyle and being ready, prepped, and equipped and fit to do the good works that God has prepared in advance for you to do, Ephesians 2.10, requires what? This, right here, okay? There's no such thing in the Christian life as getting saved by accepting the cross of Jesus Christ and then closing this and throwing it on the closet floor and never opening it, never getting accustomed to it, never getting acquainted with it, never becoming a master of what it says. The Christian life is dependent on knowing the Word of God. So if you're in 2 Timothy, go over to, uh, go to 2 Peter, last one we'll look at, and then we'll look at some things. Uh, 2 Peter. Oh, what was the book that comes before it? See, the good thing about new people coming to our church is all my old jokes, I can recycle them again. People who've been here a long time are like, okay, second Peter chapter one, look at verse 20 and 21. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Does this book, does this collection of books come from the minds of men? No. just had a conversation with somebody this past week who tried to make that argument. This is not the result or the product of men. This is the product of God. Men are just merely the instruments that he used to communicate this. He used men to communicate to men, but this comes from a higher origin than the mind that stands six feet off the ground. How do you debate that? You've had that question for a while, haven't you? Haven't you? 
Yeah? Have you been studying it since you asked the question? All right, that's a good, that's an excellent question. Mark's question for the camera and those listening later on, because <laughs> we are on, on film, right? Boy, that's dated. Uh, we are being recorded. Uh, don't, uh, Mark's question was, um, if the scriptures are in fact from God, how do we prove that they are from God? How do we maybe explain uh, persuasively to people who don't believe that, that in fact it is from God? Um, you just have to accept it on blind faith, Mark. I'm willing to do that. No, we are not willing to do that. We have more than enough evidence. We have prophecy fulfilled. No other book has that. We have the accuracy with uh, history and with archaeology and with science of the scriptures. We have the, the, the internal consistency of the word. We have the manuscript evidence, right, that's been preserved to be able to give us a, an accurate record in our own language now. We can have in our own language an accurate record of what's preserved in the original languages. So we have a ton of reason. We have more we can go through, and um, that would digress us into a whole other class. But the point is, is we have, uh, we have lots of reason to believe that this is not simply men speaking, but this is God speaking through men. Okay? In other words, when we read 1 Peter, and it says, prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God. Thus saith the Lord. You can't beat that. I, don't, I mean, I'm not like a King James only guy, but man, that thus saith the Lord, I think the NIV should have that in there. <laughs> thus. Just sounds, what's that? ESV does. ESV, get out of here. <laughs> Ray said the ESV does. Okay. So why do we study the Bible? Why do we study the Bible? Um, number one, okay, to know God. To know God. That's the first reason we study the Bible, at least on my list. Okay? We want to know this God who has made us, who has created us. We want to know what he's like. I was having a conversation with a guy this past week, and kind of giving me his views, these very eclectic views on spirituality, really kind of way out there, but drawing from weird stuff from all over the place. And I asked him the question, I said, do you just want to believe what you want to believe, or do you actually want to know what is true? Like, if there is any real truth beyond what you think. And it just kind of gave pause in the conversation to really reflect on, you know, that's a I don't know. I, I think I want to really know truth because everything that I was hearing from this person was, was more or less just like, I like this idea, so I'll pull it in. I like this idea, so I'll pull it. Sort of like a la carte, right? I'm going to form God in whatever image that I like or would like God to be in, okay? I want to know God. Here's the, here's the point is, is I don't know what God is like, therefore I am dependent upon God to show me what he is like and to tell me what he is like. That's the purpose of Bible study. God answered that need by giving us his word. So to know God, what is this God like? Uh, you're not going to believe this, but we've been spending a summer so far trying to get that question answered a little more. Right? Attributes of God in the sermon series. Okay, the second reason is spiritual growth. The reason we want to know how to study the Bible is spiritual growth. We could say 2 Peter 3.18... Remember what 2 Peter 3.18 says? It says, therefore, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So spiritual growth is one of the reasons that we seek to understand better the Word of God. When we understand the Word of God better, it is going to position us to be growing more than if we didn't. The third reason is to be discerning. Now, I like to pronounce it discerning. I hear it pronounced discern. I don't know what's the actual right way to, but discerning just to me sounds more, I don't know, more better. Is that even a way to, Acts 17.11. Do you remember what Acts 17.11 is? The Bereans. Remember the Bereans? The Bereans in Acts 17, 11, they're like, hey, Paul, what are you talking about? Huh, we're hearing what you're saying. And it says they were more noble than the, was it the Thessalonians? 
and where they, where they, because they would listen to what Paul said, and it says that they would go back and they would study the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true according to the word of God. Do you understand the value on it? Don't miss the word used. They were more noble for being discerning. You know what I mean? Like, like, like you don't just gobble up everything you hear as a Christian. You hear out in conferences or on, the, on, on, on videos and um, YouTube and in books and, and in, when you're in a, a church somewhere. You don't just gobble it up. You listen to what you're hearing and you begin to examine it because this is the standard that everything is measured by. We're discerning, okay? The thing is guidance. The Word of God. We study the Word of God so that we can have guidance. Psalm 119, 105. They made it into a song. Thy Word. Thy word is a what to my feet? Lamp unto my feet and a, and a light unto my path. The guidance that comes from the word of God. You will, you will not get any more superior guidance than what you get from the scriptures. Then we have last one. And I've added this one in recent years because I've just been more and more convicted of it. We study the Word of God, become more loving. And that is Mark 12 30, the greatest command love what? With all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. Love who? God. And love who? Your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So those are the two greatest commands are to love. Love God and love your neighbor. In my humble, but firm opinion, all Bible study and correct handling of the Word of God should increase our love. That's what it should result in. I cannot imagine that the point of God revealing His Word to us to strengthen and grow us as Christians would not simultaneously, if not preeminently, lead to a greater and greater love in our hearts. In other words, if we're getting a bigger and bigger head with all of our knowledge, but our heart is staying small, Something is wrong. Okay? This should be growing with this. Okay? So that's uh, so those are some reasons to study the Bible. We could come up with more, but those are want some to get us out of the gates there. Um, all right. What do I have next here? Now, we need to be careful in the study of God's Word. And I want to show you why. So if you're in 2 Peter, uh, I want you to turn... Back to James. We're going to work our way backwards in the Bible to a couple of verses. So you'll have 1 Peter and then James. And go to James chapter 3, which sobers up every pastor, or should, and anybody who would ever stand up and teach the Word of God to people. James chapter 3, verse 1. He gives a warning. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Be judged more strictly. That ought to stop everybody in their tracks. Um, careful study and handling of the Word of God is important. Perhaps the, go back to 2 Timothy, if you remember where you were in that a few moments ago, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Sure, a number of you are familiar with this. 2 Timothy 2, 15. He says, do your best. To present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and here it is, and who correctly handles the word of truth. So what is the opposite of correctly handling the word of truth? Incorrectly, Incorrectly handling the word of truth. There are those who do that. 
for instance. You don't have to turn there, but let me just share with you a few people. Jude says, uh, defend the faith once for all entrusted to the saints for certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago. They've secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. They twist the word of God. They twist the words of God, the concepts that God gives us in his teachings. And they do that to promote ungodliness. Okay. They incorrectly handle the word. Paul uh, excuse me, Peter was speaking to, <clears throat> in his second letter, uh, his audience, and he says, in 2 Peter chapter 3, you don't have to go there, but listen to what he says. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. So here we have Peter recognizing Paul, who is writing things, that God gave him, okay? Writing things and communicating those things. And listen to what he says. He writes in the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Is that true? <laughs> You're reading his letters, if you, if you would agree with that. Now listen to what he says. He's, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. Is that correctly or incorrectly handling the word of God? Yeah. Yeah. So it's possible to incorrectly handle the word of God. And he says out of ignorance, out of ignorance, not a lack of education, not a lack of excelling in academics, but people who are ignorant of God, ignorant of godliness and righteousness. Because there are a lot of very, very educated people in theology and religion. Randall, remember when we were talking to him on the way out of Coast Guard? That girl who said, well, I'm a religions major, and like she was all an expert in all the religions. She may know the tenets of a faith. She didn't know God. Okay? You can be educated and ignorant of God. And that's what he's saying is these people are ignorant. Uh, you can go with me to um, Jeremiah chapter 8. This one just, I discovered this one, I think it was last year or the year before. You're like, man, you're a pastor. Shouldn't you have like discovered it a long time ago before that? But I discovered it and I got it now. But Jeremiah chapter 8. I love, well, I don't love this. This is sad, but, but man, listen to God here. Jeremiah 8. He says, this is this is God speaking to the Israelites. The Israelites, oh, uh, chapter 8, verse 8. There you go. Um, chapter 8, verse 8. God speaking to the Israelites. Listen to what he says. How can you, these are his covenant people, how can you say, quote, we are wise, for we have the law of the Lord, when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely. So the very people who are charged with the teaching and dissemination of God's word to the Israelites, what are they doing with his word? Don't be afraid. Go ahead. Belt it out. Misrepresenting his word. They're lying about God. They're incorrectly handling the scriptures. There's a difference between having the scriptures and handling them correctly. A lot of people have Bibles. A lot of people even use Bibles, right? But this, you can manipulate this. I've, you've heard me say this before. You can manipulate this to say whatever you want it to say. It doesn't mean it says that, though. But you can manipulate it to say that, okay? Who's the master of this, this deception? Huh? Satan. Satan. And what's the, what's the, what's the, uh, the, the passage that perhaps captures that the best. You guys remember? What's, what's that? He is the father of lies. Yeah, uh, John chapter 8, that's a great one. The moment when Satan is tempting Jesus is perhaps when he's acting at his best as the father of lies. But do you remember what he's doing in Matthew 4 when, when he's tempting Jesus in the wilderness? He's using scripture. He's using scripture. Yeah, that's his favorite. It's not the Quran, right? 
It's, 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 not, it's, it's, it's not like other, it's not Alice Bailey's New Age uh, volumes. It's not that stuff. That's not his favorite. He likes those. His best one, though, is God's actual truth. That's what he loves to use best, because you can misrepresent what God says using what God said. Correctly handle the word of truth. That's what, that's what we're talking about. So I, we, I could go on, but um, you know I could go on, but I'm not going to go on. Okay. Um, one thing I want to bring out, though, just one more concept, one more point, is the idea, of, the idea of imminence and transcendence, which makes us dependent on this, on the word of God. The idea of imminence versus transcendence. Okay? Because God is transcendent, then therefore I am dependent on him to give me information from his existence outside of creation. Okay, so if I were to just simply say, okay, so you got these two views of God. You have like imminence. This is immanence, right? So this is not imminent, like God will be here soon or at any moment, but this is immanence, right? This is that God and creation, God and the universe are inherently one. Okay? Like, like you can find God in the universe. Any beliefs you've ever come across that are similar to that? Remember my little skit up here about, you know, all the people doing theology, coming up with their ideas of God? Yeah, like New Agers, uh, Hinduism, you know, God, the pantheists, essentially, who believe, environmentalists even, yeah. I mean, guy, hey, look, I've met some, some raving environmentalists downtown Grand Haven who, when we're witnessing, who are going on and on and on, and, and, and you start talking to them long enough, pretty soon they believe in, like, Mother Earth. It's all, very, it's all spiritual beliefs. All spiritual beliefs that ultimately lead us. So imminence is that God, right? God equals, okay, the universe, let's say. Creation. One and the same. Like, like, like the universe and God are in the same box, you could say. Right? Transcendence, however, is God is not in here, right? He's not in here. We live in this created existence. God lives outside of, above, beyond. Remember, we spent some time on that in one of our sermons. Outside of and beyond. So the point is this. You can't find God looking in here. You can find out things about the Creator simply by knowing... You can be a scientist who studies nature. And, and in that, like... Uh, uh, what's the guy's name? <laughs> Newton. Like Newton, okay... Like Isaac Newton say, wow, now I, I, I've discovered like the laws of gravity. I've discovered things. And in his, in his big mathematical magnus opus, he said, uh, he said now I want to know the one who's behind all of this. Einstein said something similar, remember? When he got proven wrong about uh, his theory of relativity and that there was a beginning point of the universe. The point is this, is that you can discover some things as a scientist studying the creation that God has made, but you can't know the person of God. And you can't know him personally because he's not, by simply looking in the universe, being a scientist, you have to have him break into this universe you live in and give you revelation of who he is and what he is like. Does that make sense? How did he do that to, for us? Oh. Amen. Amen. Where's my Bible? Here it is. I need to have like multiple Bibles laying around so I can just grab one. So, so you have the imminence of God and you have the transcend, or you have imminence versus transcendence. And God is transcendent. And because he's transcendent, we need him to communicate with us because we're essentially in a box trying to get out to reach him, but we can't get out to reach him. He's got to come inside our box. So that's what this is. This is him coming inside our box. Jesus Christ coming into the world, the incarnation of the word of God is God coming into our universe for what? To know him, right? To, to know him, to turn us to righteousness, to grow spiritually, to discern false teachings about him, to be to, to guidance for living, loving, all that stuff. Okay? Um, where are we at on time? Whew, one minute, my alarm's going to go off. Come on. Okay. When this goes off, I'm going to snooze, as I usually... Yeah, yeah. Well, you guys have been here when I'm teaching, right, and the alarm goes off, I snooze it. Just... So I get home. Okay. Okay. So, 
how to study the Bible. Okay? We study, first of all, the, dealing with our attitudes here. We, we have a, a reverent attitude towards the Word of God. We have a humble attitude when we come to the Word of God. We come prayerfully. We should be talking to God when we are... Snooze five minutes. We should be talking to God when we are coming to find out what God said in talking to us. Okay? And asking for wisdom. Spirit-dependent. Spirit dependent. If you're in your Bible there, go to second or first Corinthians, excuse me. First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two. And then in first Corinthians chapter two, verse fourteen. We should read the verses before and after because it really it's powerful, but we're just going to read verse 14 for time. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So if someone does not have the Spirit of God, they cannot understand and understand in a way that they accept and understand and, and subscribe to what the Word of God says. Right? Like, like there are atheists who get the teachings of the Bible. Like they can understand intellectually what they're, being, what, they're, what they're reading. Like Christopher Hitchens, in his debates, understands the purpose of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The difference is he rejects it as foolishness. Okay? That's what his whole debate is. He rejects it as foolishness, or he did when he was alive. Okay? So the Spirit of God we are dependent on in order uh, to understand the Word of God. Pop quiz, who is the one that inspired the authors of Scripture to write? The Holy Spirit. So don't you think it's to our advantage to rely on the Holy Spirit who authored those words? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit works through this and through a person who is humble and who is prayerful and reverent and dependent on him, in order to gain understanding of the scriptures. And then fifthly, we come responsibly. Okay? We come responsibly. That means we don't sit around and go, hey, what's it mean to you? Okay? And what's it mean to you? Okay? And what's it mean to you? Okay? I don't care what it means to anyone. I care what this means to who? God. What did he mean when he, the Holy Spirit, inspired men to write these words? We could even say, we're going to get into this next week and the, the, the following weeks, is what did Paul mean when he wrote to these Corinthians? What was the context of him writing these things? And, and what are we observing him say? I want to know. I don't care what I think or what I want. I have to have a, a, a blank marker board when it comes to my prejudices and my biases because I have to, I have to come with an attitude that says, I'm a blank board, and God, I'm ready for you to write onto me what you mean in the Word of God. This is what we come with right here when we come to the Word of God. We come blankly ready for the Word of God to inform us. If we start saying, well, I believe God is, is part of creation, but, and that's the thing I'm going to start with. I have already started with a preconception or with a presupposition that I don't that I have to justify. Why would I believe that? Okay? If I believe this is truth, then I'm coming as someone who does not have truth. I am an empty vessel who is in need of being filled with truth. This is truth. This is the picture, or the picture, and it pours into me what is truth. I need to not be filled up with other things that aren't true. Okay, I want to get to my cool diagram because, well, I think it's cool. Okay, responsible means we're going to use the inductive method. Gather specific details and let those details form a big picture idea of what's being said. Okay? We're going to have to specifically look. It means we slow down when we get into the scriptures here and we get into a passage. We look at a passage over and over. We're really digesting it. We're, we're intentionally observing what's being said in it. And we're going to look at all those tactics next week for observance. And then we're going to say, okay, this is going to come up and form a picture and inform me of what it says and what it means. Okay? Have you ever seen someone or read someone who 
does the opposite, who says, I'm going to come in to the text, and I'm going to come with my own ideas, and I'm going to force the Bible to accept those ideas. Yeah, I, we, could start, we could spend quite a series going through all of that. My snooze. Let's cause, uh, for a couple of minutes, we'll snooze again. Um, hopefully we're not really sleeping out there. Is anybody sleeping? So this is my picture, right? You see all the different shapes, individual shapes? I'm picture-oriented. I, I, like, I need a Bible with pictures. So we, need, we take these individual things that we see in the scriptures, and then we put them together to form a whole. They come together to form a whole picture. Okay? That's kind of what we're doing. We don't want to make these mistakes. We're going to stop right here, okay? We're going to stop right here. But we don't want to make these mistakes. We don't want to do scripture hunting. You know what scripture hunting is? Scripture hunting is when, well, when I have an idea of what I want to be true, and then I go and I cherry pick Bible verses to support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what scripture hunting is. Self-centered, uh, self-centered. Where do I have this on here? I don't. So, self-centered is when. I basically read everything how I think I want it to mean. Like I'm going, well, what does it mean to me? Okay, what does it mean to me? Again, I, we don't care what it means to us. We want to know what it meant, what God meant, what he wanted us to understand about its meaning. Spiritualize. Oh. Spiritualizing. Spiritualizing is when you take verses and you take words in the Bible or passages in the Bible and then you don't let them mean what they say. In other words, and you assign a different meaning to those words. You just make, you, you have some made up meaning or some meaning that you think that it means. Uh, it, it just, but you're not going to let it mean what it says on the pages. It has to mean something else, something hidden usually, something sort of uh, uh, more elite, you might even say, something that is, uh, something that is spiritualized. The, the literal or the plain method of reading the Bible means that I'm going to take what the Bible says plainly on the page unless I'm absolutely forced to do otherwise. Unless it forces me to believe that it means something else. We'll get into that when we get into interpretation. And then springboarding. If you, you know, it, 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 that's a great method of uh, being pragmatic in preaching and in teaching is you start with maybe like a Bible verse and then you spring off from the scriptures from that one Bible verse and then you never return to the Bible and you just go and teach some how-to or some get better or some pragmatic lesson and, and make it look like that Bible verse is really meaning for you. It, you know what I mean? You get what I'm saying? Okay, you've, you've come across that. Don't make these mistakes. I say this to me. Don't make these mistakes, Justin. Okay, we have to be careful students of the word. We have to rightly handle the word of God. And there's so much more I want to get to, but... I'm going to get up before my alarm goes off. So let's pause this a second. And I think we'll have one, one time for maybe one or two questions if anybody has a question. Does anybody have a question? Hmm? Mark? Was that a raise? Was it itching in the head? Okay. All right, well, good. I'll take that as I was clear as mud. All right. Well, let's, uh, if you do have any questions, again, you're welcome to email me or get a hold of me. Um, but we'll pick up where we left off next week and we'll start getting into our first, our first um, step, which is observation. Okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning, uh, we are just enriched for having your word opened up to us, feeding on it. We pray, Father, that you bless us as we go forth to the best of our ability to be workmen who are approved, rightly dividing the word, not needing to be ashamed when we stand before you for being like those scribes of old who falsely handled and lied with their pens in the way that they handled your word. God, let us not be like that. Let us not be those with itching ears and let us not be those who would, who would, uh, who would give what itching ears want to hear. But God, may we always seek above all else truth and in that seeking, find Jesus in everything, God. So we pray that the product of this class in our lives is 
a, a, a clearer vision of who you are. And God, as we explored too, a greater love for you and love for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.